Okay, so today we're going to talk about Further Seems Forever. Now, this is one of the most important bands in Tooth & Nail history, and the thing is this, they almost never made it to their first record. So this band exploded onto the scene in 2001, and they were breaking new ground with this combination of hardcore and technical music plus emotional singing and lyrics. Their debut album, The Moon Is Down, really was pivotal, ushering in a new era for Tooth & Nail and the scene at large. And if you boil it down, this band really only had two magnificent ingredients. They were one part fine-tuned machine, that is, all the musicians from the hardcore band Strongarm, who had spent most of the previous decade perfecting technical songwriting and arranging and performing. Now, the other ingredient in the Further Seems Forever formula was a fresh-faced, wide-eyed young talent who was to become the prototype of an emo superstar. Now, it seemed to be an unconventional move at the time, but it proved to be just the new sound that I think we were all waiting to hear. Now, I'm serious. This band almost never existed. And if they hadn't, the subsequent list of bands that wouldn't have existed, that were influenced or inspired directly by them, would be truly nothing short of a tragedy. Now, there often exists a fundamental tension between lead singers and their bands, and it's not uncommon, uh, as you'll see throughout this podcast series and other episodes, that there's a volatility and chaos that occurs when you mix personal relationships, business, ambition, and art all together. In fact, this may be the very fuel for greatness, but before you get to greatness, there's the fundamental question, can this thing be held together or not? So obviously, Further Seems Forever does exist and did make it, but the problems that plagued them in their first few months leading up to the completion of The Moon Is Down didn't go away. Over the next few years, this band would go on to release three albums with three different lead singers, and the drama did not go away. It followed right along. But what was that drama, and how did it really go down? Well, prepare for takeoff. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Did you have a conception that Dashboard would be bigger than Further? No, but I also thought Further was going to be huge, but partly because he was in it. He kind of sold us on the fact he was done doing music, which was probably an embellishment. <laughs> Oh yeah, and I almost forgot to introduce myself to you. My name is Matt Carter, I'm the guitar player from Emory, and then I brought along a couple of buddies to do the podcast with me. So Toby Morrell, the singer of Emory, and Aaron Lunsford, the drummer for As Cities Burn. So I brought these guys along because I can't do all this work by myself, so I sent them out to research the stories and do the interviews and gather the tape, as they say in the biz, and come back and share it with me and tell me what they found, and we're going to discuss it and share it with you guys. So that's how this is going to work. Okay, Toby. Now, why'd you want to do this episode first? Um, honestly, this episode was so interesting and fun for me to work on, guys, because I was a huge Further Scenes Forever fan and then even an even bigger Dashboard Confessional fan. I love this band and always wondered why did Chris leave? Like, I mean, I just I couldn't understand how you could leave a band like Further Scenes Forever. And at the same time, was so happy because my emo heart just loved Chris Caraba and his acoustic guitar just wailing. That just made my day. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, I mean, I was a huge Further Chains Forever fan too, but going through all this and learning about uh, where they came from, the bands they were in before Further Chains Forever, the other guys, not Chris Caraba, Strong Arm and Shah Halud, they were huge, like, big deals in the hardcore scene. They were kind of tired of doing this hardcore thing and wanted to move into a guy singing instead of screaming. And so then enters this little no-name kid who looks cool and maybe writes some cool lyrics named Chris Caraba and kind of changes the face of not only of rock music, Christian music especially. Uh huh. So so what you're saying is that Really, it was the the band under the band behind Chris Caraba that really launched him into stardom itself, and then Dashboard. Yeah, it's funny because Further Seems Forever, I think, kind of launched this whole 
uh, hardcore screamo, screaming, singing era. Honestly, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if they get credit for that, but they were a hardcore band which all, brought in all the tough guys, and then they had this lead singer who not only was writing lyrics that could make everybody's heart melt, but also he was kind of yelling them and, and singing them super emotionally and very intensely, yeah. which kind of spawned this whole generation of music in the early 2000s. Yeah, if you look back at the South Florida scene in that time, there was a lot of really cool bands coming up together, but all of different genres. So like Strong Arm and Shah Halud, and then out of that was born like Newfound Glory and Further Scenes Forever, and then of course Dashboard. Um, but they would all just kind of play the same shows together, and that's how all these people just got to know each other, and then started starting all these other you know bands that would get big. Okay, so now I've got to introduce you to another team member of ours, and that's Billy Power. Billy was a A&R guy at Tooth & Nail through the late 90s, and at the time when Further Seems Forever was signed. Uh, Billy lives in New York and recently caught up with the guys in Further Seems Forever when they were doing a reunion show at the Gramercy Theater. In my office, I have the, uh, the original letter that you sent me when you made your very first cassette demo. Hey, Bill, this is our new band with a Chris singing, I think is the way you worded it, something like that. A different Chris? Yeah, a different Chris singing or something. Yeah, that's what it was, yeah. And then, uh, and then it took me like a year to sign you guys. Do you remember that? No, it took us a year to actually record. Right, yeah. Like, I think immediately I said, yeah, I want to sign you, right? Like, immediately. Yeah. I was like, let's do it. Like, it was because you were the only one that responded. We sent it to all these labels, which is funny because, you know, I meet the guy from Vagrant, who actually ended up it manages Chris and we're like, we sent you sent you a demo, no response. No, you didn't. I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> like the guy from Trust Kill recently, I was like, hey man, we sent you a demo. And he's like, I have all my demos. I'm gonna go through it. Yeah. It, but Did he find it? Nah, I don't know. He's <laughs> trying to say that he never sent it to you. Yeah. Wait a second. You guys are Christian. Mm-mm. Yeah, no thanks. Well, he's not around anymore, and you are, so joke's on him. Sort of. We're sort of around. <laughs> sort of around. It is funny because so many things were seemingly kind of lining up against them. You know what I mean? Like, it was, it, it's crazy. Like you said, they're Christian. They're hardcore, but now with a singer who sings emotional broken heart lyrics and the girls like it and the guys like it but the hardcore dudes probably don't and there's internal strife within the band as well so i'm not sure from the get-go right at the beginning there's strife right away i don't think he realized it but i believe chris had dashboard in his back pocket the entire time he was in further and i believe because they were hearing his demos how could they not feel a little intimidated and a little insecure because they were hearing this awesome music, which went on to sell millions and millions of records. Did you get the sense that Chris, him, even himself, before joining Further Seems Forever, knew that he was a superstar? Do you think he knew all along that he was going to make it and, and, and be this big? Well, I'll say this. It, it was intimidating to get to interview him. And be, just because he's so professional, I mean, he our, our correspondence back and forth, he is super detailed and like scheduled to the minute. And I kind of believe it because he is... Chris Caraba. I mean, he, in his mind, he's Chris Caraba. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it, he, and you think he always was, even all the way back? I, I think so. I think he was just very confident and kind of sure of himself in certain ways. Some, some ways probably not, but in a lot of ways, I think he knew where he wanted to go. I think he knew he wanted to be an acoustic singer songwriter kind of guy. And he was in this band that he liked, but those guys, I think, probably maybe wanted more out of him and weren't getting it, and it just started butting heads. So really, I think the tension was baked in right from the get-go. So we were fortunate enough to get to talk to Chris Caraba about this. Toby interviewed him and asked him about the tension that was already in the band before they even made their first record, what his intent for Dashboard was, and what it was like navigating all that and trying to get out of his record deal with Brandon Ebel, the owner of Tooth & Nail Records. Oh, um, my take on on Brandon Ebel? Well, I don't know Brandon well. we, uh, I remember meeting him at that, that tooth and nail night before Cornerstone and, and him telling me how excited he was about the band. I remember him uh, sort of hinting that it was going to be a big priority for them at the label. Um, and that made me feel lucky because we didn't have a choice of labels where we could choose one that was going to make us a priority. Since we you know, were sort of grandfathered into tooth and nail, 
but for them, for him to then say we were going to be a priority, um, that felt really good. You'd have to ask the other guys if, if they felt they were made a priority, because like I said, I wasn't in the band. Um, I was already out of the band before the, the record actually came out. Okay, so from Chris's point of view, he was barely in the band at all and wanted to leave and go do Dashboard. They hadn't even recorded or put out the record yet, but nonetheless, he'd signed a deal with Tooth & Nail. So that's a little bit confusing. So Aaron, can you, can you tell me how these kind of things work with record contracts? So record contracts uh, often have either key member clauses or just stipulations where you can't just break up your band and start a new band and expect not to have to keep your obligations to your current label. So you couldn't just say, our band broke up, then rename it, and then go to another label. Correct. It keeps you from doing that. Or one person leaving and starting a new band, and then the other members come join one at a time. Yeah, I think the thing with Chris, he doesn't necessarily even like the band that he's in right now. It seems like heads are kind of heated and they're not getting along. And then he signed his life away to this Christian label. Like, I don't know what what his plans (laughs) were. And he had buyer's remorse immediately. Right, he immediately had buyer's remorse. (laughs) (laughs) We thought about talking to other labels and certainly other labels talked to us um, very, you know, just out of curiosity, are you free to do something basically, you know? And we weren't though, because Tooth & Nail had... um, an option for the guys that were in strong arm that whatever band they did next, uh, tooth and nail could have the option to, to release it and they loved it. So they, so they did. So what was going on, though, that Chris was stoked to be in this band and then immediately wanted to be out of it? Were they not giving him creative input or something like that? He told us that he had been pitching songs to them as he was writing them. I think even as Further Scenes Forever songs, like he felt obligated to. Oh. But they kind of passed on him like they just didn't think it fit for the band. Okay, so he would bring these songs and he might have been thinking he could make his songs fit and this would be his vehicle and then it became apparent at some point that the band didn't want to use all of his songs that went in the dashboard confessional basket. Yes, and and, and honestly, I I think that might have played into some of them uh, not working well together because imagine you're writing these songs and then the guys in this hardcore band say, nah, just write something else. This isn't really us, even though you're writing that and you're thinking you're giving your songs to this band and they don't even want Mm -hmm. them. And Billy also talked to their guitar player, Steve, about this. And I never bemoaned Chris for his, you know, because I had that desire too, personally. I was, at that point in time, I was just like, yeah, let's do it. Everything and anything. So he goes on to talk about how the band was basically torn on the direction. Should they go with this Chris Caraba stuff that he's doing? They've seen other bands be really successful. They know they have a possibly a, a big career here. And then on the other hand, they need to stay true to what they are. And um, yeah, it, it was sort of a, with some of the guys, it was just, you know, appreciate the sentiment, not really sure if, if it's feasible or if we're able to. And, and we know we definitely enjoy what we're writing, what's coming out of us, but um, not really sure the overall direction. And Chris was more definitive, you know, and I was with him. I, not only did I respect that, but I was sort of in that camp too. But, uh, you know, some of the other guys weren't. So, and I understood, you know, he, there was valid points to each side of the stick at that point. And you know, sometimes it's just fear, you know, you just... You got to, if you do what you really want to love to do, then, you know, just, just do it. Okay. So now Chris sees the writing on the wall that he's not going to get to do what he wanted to do originally and further seems forever. And so now he's got this music that's dashboard confessional and has these great demos of amazing music. That's very obvious to anybody that it's going to be really big. So he goes to Brandon Ebel, owner of Tooth & Nail Records and amazing talent scout and says, hey, here's my dashboard confessional thing. Uh, listen to it and see if you like it, but if it's okay with you, can I just go put this out on another label? And Brandon says, sure, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, a record label owner, said, nah, this probably ain't going to be any good. 
<laughs> yeah, I, don't, right. I don't know if I totally can go there. And not only that, they'd seen him do it live to great effect at Cornerstone Festival. Actually, Chad kind of dragged me over to this. Uh, we're playing a, a Christian music festival called um, Cornerstone, and it was a fun weekend because the first night before the festival, Tooth and Nail rented out the stages. And it was tooth and nail night. That was so much fun. Uh, further played. And then the next day, the, the whole true festival started and further was going to play again. But there were these tents all around where people were playing solo shows. Or I, I should say acoustic shows. I th- I'm pretty sure. Um, I think Pedro the Lion was playing in one of these tents. And um, Chad said, Chris, come with me. Grab your acoustic guitar. And I, I didn't really know what we were up to. And I really wasn't that comfortable. I don't think I had really played in front of many people before or any people before really by myself. But Chad was, he had his little plan, I guess, and kind of threw me in this tent and there was people there. And I said, what am I doing here? And he said, well, you're going to, you're going to play dashboard songs. People are going to love this. And, uh, you know, to be given not only like that, um, encouragement from your bandmates about these songs that may not have been appropriate for the band we were in, but they still believed in me as a songwriter. That felt really good. And to have him standing there with that big smile that Chad has, you know, kind of proud. As I, as I sang and kind of got over my stage fright uh, singing in front of people, I'll never forget that. All right, and here's Further's drummer, Chad, talking about what he remembers about the early Dashboard stuff. We were doing some shows. Chris had these other songs. Yeah, even a couple of them, I think he even brought up to us, but for whatever reason, it just didn't fit in the mold of mm-hmm. what we were writing that were actually Further songs. Not that they were bad. They were just like, you know, something a little different. And so it was Screaming Infidelities one of those songs I feel like that, that was. Maybe not quote me on it, but I would imagine probably. Yeah. It was a song that he, definitely some of the early stuff he had played to us, and we didn't dislike it. We were just like, yeah, I don't know if it really fits, you know, based on what we've written to this point. It's sort of like a different album almost or something. And um, he wanted up just, okay, well, you know, I'll just use this for this other thing I'm doing. And then he caught fire in a short period of time at sort of this renaissance with, you know, somebody going around just playing acoustically that and, uh, you know, looked good, and he was sort of singer-songwriter type stuff. It was and pretty unusual for that time. It seemed to be a lull in that kind of activity. Right. And so Chris is like, on top of the talent, you know, right place, the right time, the timing was there. You know, sometimes that's what it takes, a couple different aspects to sort of line up. Okay, so the dashboard thing started catching on still before they'd even gone in the studio to record The Moon Is Down. So here's, here's the craziest thing of all. Further Scenes Forever is getting ready to go into the studio, get started with their new singer, Chris Caraba, and Chris is wanting out. That is what blows my mind, is that they finally have gotten this far. They're taking this step with this singer, and Chris wants out. And so the the record, The Moon Is Down, is basically not going to happen. I mean, it's going it's to like be changed hostage. forever. Like, if you wanted to be out of your record deal or do something else, what the what? A, that's the craziest time to try to stop like in the studio when it's already paid for when the money's already there when everybody's there they're in the studio with wisner and then that's when he tries to quit yeah a lot of the music was already done i think maybe all the music was done so it was like time for chris to do vocals and that's when brandon got the call (laughs) and brandon and chris just don't remember this the same way at all I know that Brandon listened to Dashboard and he didn't hear in Dashboard something he wanted to put out and he released me for that. I could do that anywhere else, he said. Well, his lyrics, his vocal delivery, he was awesome singer live. His stage presence, his looks, everything. He had it, the whole package. Like We were like, wow. And when I wanted to move on from Tooth & Nail as a label, of course I had to, I had, of course I had to ask Brandon to release me and he did. So years later, Brandon said, you know, kind of like when I ran into him somewhere, kind of gave me a a slap on the back and said, I really wish I'd I'd heard what I hear now in Dashboard. So we were about ready to spend a ton of money on Further Scenes Forever and break them to to be like the next MXPX. Not musically, they're not pop punk, but like the next big thing. And um, we got a phone call right before they went in the studio and he called me and he just, and his lawyer was on the phone and he said he didn't want to be in Further Scenes Forever anymore. And we were like, well, what are you talking about? You're about ready to go in and record. And then the band called me and said they didn't want him in the band anymore. They had a falling out. Crazy. And I had just been in a bunch of drama with MXPX, which at that time in the, like, all through the 90s, that was the only band I ever had any trouble with. And I was a little burnt out from all of it. And, you know, I had a loyalty to the strong arm guys because they'd been on my label for years. So 
he said he wasn't going to record the further album. We were about ready to go in the studio. And I'm like, well, you have to. We have a contract. And he goes, I'm not going to do it. And I don't want to do music anymore, is what he said. He said he didn't want to do music anymore. Yes, that is a fact. So I kind of thought that was not true, but... I was trying to be a peacemaker at the time and kind of burn out from all the drama of the past. So I was just like, well, if you go in and record the further album, I'll let you do your deal. But it wasn't the kind of band he was looking for at the time. I think that worked out well for everybody. So I signed an artist recording contract. I expect him to fulfill it. Why I let him out and no one else? I have no idea why I did that. <laughs> Either way, I did. Because, you know, we continued to take tooth and nail bands like MXPX on the road, Dashboard did. And I took out Further on the road. I took out other tooth and nail bands. And I won't go through the whole list, but I often took tooth and nail bands on the road because of two factors, two or three factors. Uh, my friends that worked at that label were really kind. Brandon had an, didn't give me any reason to feel any resentment as I walked out the door. And I still loved what Tooth & Nail was, was doing as a label and felt from my perspective that I still wanted to be involved to the extent that I could. So they had an internal conflict in the band. Chris was not getting along with Further Scenes Forever guys. He did not not want to go into the studio and record with the band. So I said, look, if you go in and record with the band, I will let you out of your contract and you can do Dashboard elsewhere. But I tried to get him to do out Dashboard with me, but I was also trying to keep the other guys happy because they were in strong arm and they were my friends and Bill, mostly Bill Power's friends. It was very complicated. So, Do you regret it? What of course regret? I regret it. You, what, you wish you did what? I would have just told him, look, man, you have to record for Further Scenes Forever. We just signed a contract. I just gave you money. And if you want to do Dashboard, you can do it with us. And we'll blow you up and make you and the next thing. if you're not interested in music, good. Don't do it. Yeah. But if you call, want to you, Call your music, bluff. Yeah. Yeah, for here. Yeah. I mean, he signed a contract. And by the way, we had just sold like a million MXPX records. And we had sold a million Supertones records. And we had sold... Well over 100,000 Project 86 records, and we had sold 100,000 Juliana Theory records. I mean, we could have totally done it. Did, did you take it as a slight that he didn't want to do any stuff with you? Like, why, why did he want to go to Draft or Vagrant and all that? Why, why? I think he was already, his lawyer was already talking to people, you know? Of course I took it as a slight. He just, it was like a weak moment, you know? That's fine, though. I mean, it all that's worked a, out. To you, that's a weak moment, not a charitable or peacemaker, like, Oh, it was definitely a peacemaker moment because I was being but, loyal. But you see it as a weakness, like a, a regret and a weakness. Well, it's a regret because he went on to sell a million records and you knew he was going to be big. <laughs> That's why I was begging him to finish the further record or yeah. record it. Chris didn't seem to even care whether the moon is down got made or not. I believe he would have sacrificed that if he could have, but Brandon held his feet to the fire, had the money spent, and as an outcome, we all have that record that has changed all of our lives. I know. And then so Chris leaves, and then they're back at it again trying to get another good-looking, uh, broken heart lyric, amazing lyric writer, singer. <laughs> Now they know what's the bright thing in the formula. They're looking so for that a record copy. comes out. Yeah, that record comes out, sells like 80,000 or 100,000, and is huge for the genre. So at this point, Further Seems Forever knows what they need is somebody like Chris Caraba. Good looking, strong singer, melodic, uh, you know, that, that whole thing. Yeah, how hilarious uh, a bunch of hardcore guys looking for a guy with tight pants, looks great, and can really sing his butt off. <laughs> yeah, because these are just dudes with beards that are really good at their instruments. Yeah, have you ever seen Further Guys? Everybody but Chris, everybody but their singers are like huge, massive men. <laughs> Look like plumbers and stuff. <laughs> right, they're men. It's not as... <laughs> <laughs> it's ironic that Chris left and then they decided to do the boy band full time. Because whatever internal band stuff they had going on, that was one of the big reasons was that Chris wanted to play music full-time. They didn't want to play music full-time. Their superstar singer leaves, and now they're like, well, maybe we should play music full-time. Because they were thrust into having enough fans and audience because of the record that Chris sang on for them. Right. So they were now big enough to tour full-time and make money and headline. Right. And so now, now they want to tour full-time. Right, you're talking. They just you're, you're talking. Need a pesky singer. <laughs> you're talking about guys who were in Christian hardcore bands who obviously weren't going to make it back then. Back back then, making it in a hardcore band was nothing like today. So they uh, yes. want, they had to stay home. They had to get their regular jobs. They needed to pay their bills and all that stuff. They had no clue that they had Chris Caraba. <laughs> they just didn't know. They had no clue that that a band like them to do full time actually could pay the bills. Right, could sell tickets. They thought you want to do full time. We know what. That means that means floors forever and five dollars a day for life. That's what they were thinking. Full time touring meant. 
Right. They they had a lead singer who had never toured before, was writing songs on an acoustic guitar, and they were pros. They had been in bands. Mm-hmm. They had done it before. They had done tours. They had done all this stuff. He had been in other bands as well, but this was like their thing. And so they were calling the shots, and they just didn't see back then what they had right in the recording yeah. studio with them. And so by the time that the moon is down is influencing us and every other future tooth and nail band and the whole music scene and the band realizes what they have and they're selling tickets and records and all this stuff, it all happens after, unfortunately, everybody's finding out as they find out this is their new favorite band, they're also finding out that singer's not in the band. (laughs) As we all found out about the band and said, this is my new favorite band, the next thing out of somebody's mouth was, but you know that singer's not in the band anymore. So I can only imagine what that must have felt like to have that and then have Chris, he, you know, he's gone. Anyway, here's Chad Neptune, the bass player. You feel like your girlfriend cheated on you, you right. know? And in retrospect, I was probably pretty juvenile about it, you know? What's the big deal? But yeah, I did I did have hard feelings initially, um, just because I just thought we had such a future, we had a thing, you know? And, um, you know, Chris was my friend. I felt like my girlfriend had broken up with me, you know? And there, there definitely was a weird time period there for a while. Yeah, and we just want to get this record out. I don't even know what we're going to do. We don't know if we're going to continue as Further Seems Forever. We know we wanted to play music. Should we get another singer? Blah, blah, blah. We didn't know what we wanted to do. So when this record comes out, by the time it comes out and the band does shows, there's never a time when they have this record out and Chris is on tour. That never happens. So I guess it's the hardest thing in the world to replace Chris Caraba, right? They weren't replacing Dashboard Confessional Chris Caraba. They were just replacing Chris. And they right. thought, oh, he, so what? He can sing, write some lyrics. We can find a million of those guys. At the time is what they thought. In retrospect, I think they probably yeah. think a lot differently. So they had the band before Chris, had all the music, he, you know, it was independent of that. And then they just thought he was a vocalist on top. So we'll just get, get another one of those. Right, when he brought his songs to them, they rejected them. (laughs) Okay, so we're going to take a quick break and tell you about a couple of amazing and current Tooth & Nail bands, but we won't stray too far from the story. I caught up with Ryan from the band Civilian yesterday, who happens to know the guys from Further and even helped to work on their last album, Penny Black. This is Ryan Alexander from Civilian. We're on the tour bus in Queens, New York City. We're on tour with Matt and Toby and the classic crime. Well, congratulations on getting your band off the ground and being out on tour and releasing a record and getting signed and all that good stuff. Tell me a little bit about touring for you and how it, how it feels. I always wanted to see the country and I've wanted to figure out a way to do it that at least comes close to paying for, for itself. And so touring is a natural, a natural way to sort of escalate wonder in terms of traveling and your creative sensibility grows seeing other bands and just sharing space with other guys. Ryan, I'm really digging seeing you guys play every night, and I want to share a part of a track from your new record. This is called The Real Thing slash The Feeling. This song's on your current album that came out last fall. You wouldn't believe what privilege costs. Give me the real thing or Give me the feeling I'm twisting your arm till you cave Or I'm breaking it all Do me a favor and say what you're thinking I'm twisting the words that you say till I hear what I want
So we're listening to a track from your album, You Wouldn't Believe What Privilege Costs. Tell us a little bit about the circumstances of writing and making this record. I uh, was experiencing my first winter in Nashville. So being from South Florida, I really saw the snow, had a job that I wasn't super happy with. And then I figured I'll just try and take a month off and write some songs and see if I see if I can come up with anything. And yeah, I just wrote it uh, over like about two weeks looking out at my uh, backyard with snow in it, so I missed the whole winter. So you're actually friends with the guys in Further Seems Forever. How'd you get to know them? I had a roommate of mine, one of his buddies from high school, went to, actually my roommate went to high school with a bunch of those guys, and so he would introduce me to them. Rob was actually the guy who uh, convinced me to move up to, to Nashville. Uh, him and his fa- family moved up to Franklin, and he says, you have no reason to not try to just move to, to a new spot and let me stay in his house for at least the first handful of months that I was that I was up there. So it's more than you just know the guys. You actually got to work on their last record, right? I got to engineer a bit on the newest uh, for the record they did with Caraba, Penny Black. Um, and I got to uh, help them build out the, the studios. They had this warehouse space that they would do all the rehearsing with, with the dashboard and the further stuff. And when they talked about doing a new further record, they didn't want to necessarily go into a studio because they didn't know how long it would take. So we just took some of the gear from the road and uh, turn the, the uh, office into the tracking room. And that was just a cool project to kind of see start to finish. Okay, so come check out Civilian on the Road right now with the Classic Crime and Matt and Toby and find their music, find their new album. You wouldn't believe what privilege costs anywhere that you buy music. Sometimes life can be so hard. Let me tell you how hard it is for me right now. I'm in Queens, New York, and literally going to miss by like a day Hearts Like Lions playing at Webster Hall in New York because I'll be gone. I'm going to be on tour. It's just too hard, Lord. I love this man. They are great. I want you to love them just as much as me, and here's how I'm going to make that happen. All I got to do is play a little bit of their song. You're going to fall in love with them just like I have. This song's called Make Your Move, and it's off their new album, If I Never Speak Again. All right. Oh, man. Make Your Move. Such a good song. Hearts Like Lines. Album's called If I Never Speak Again. It came out in February, and it's their first full length on Tooth and Nail. And they're on tour right now with A Lot Like Birds and Household. So go check and see if they're coming to your town. That's something you don't want to miss. I regret having to leave New York and not getting to see these guys play. Again, the album is called If I Never Speak Again. Go check it out. So I guess it's Strikeout City when trying to Replace Chris Caraba, right? They weren't, weren't able to do it? No, that's the crazy thing. They found Jason Gleason, a guy who looks great, who was super energetic on stage, and maybe even just as good, if not better, vocally. All right, so it's really interesting how Further Scenes Forever actually found Jason, being that this is before the internet. They couldn't just put up a Facebook post. It was through a random connection. Further Scenes Forever was getting a van from a small record label in Minnesota, and that record label happened to be the label that Jason Gleason's band, Affinity, was on, and they were going to give this van to Affinity. The record label owner calls Jason and he's like, I'm giving your van to Further Scenes Forever. Sorry. And we caught up with Jason Gleason and asked him what he remembers about joining Further Scenes Forever, and he takes over the story right there with the record label owner. I just gave your van away kind of thing, and which was really not that big of a deal to me at the time. Uh, I was sort of just like just finishing high school up and didn't need this giant gray van. He let me know he was giving him the van, and then he called me back maybe like two or three days later 
and was like, oh, by the way, Chris quit further. Uh, and I think they're looking for singers. Like, would you like me to put in a word for you? I was like, I mean, yeah, I, yeah obviously, you know? Yeah, Chad Neptune, their bass player, talked about Jason's audition tape. The internet was at its infancy. You couldn't, like, send MP3s and things like that. So we just put a thing on our website. We were like, hey, we're looking for a new singer. If you think you got what it takes, send us some demos. This is how the drummer Steve remembers that whole thing. And uh, he definitely was the most quality one that at that point we had received. We obviously had some really funny ones. And then, you know, and then he offered to make the trip cross country and, you know, I'll, I'll come, I'll do a in, in person audition. I'll stay there as long as you guys want me to. It's like his, you know, passion and just uh, sort of, he's like, you know, like, I really want to do this. And here's Jason and how he remembers it. Like two weeks later when Chad said I got the gig, actually funny story, he called me and said, hey man, like it was really nice to meet you and everything and, and you're a really good guy, but, uh, you know, we're going to go with somebody else. So, uh, you know, if you want to come sell merch, that's cool. And like, you know, little high school me was like bummed, obviously. But I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll come out with you guys. That seems like it would be fun. And and obviously it was, you know, I'm joking, joke's on you. And I, I had just turned 19. So this 19-year-old Jason Gleason uh, just gets dropped right into this brew cauldron of what is Further Seems Forever and its complexity. Right at the same time Chris Caraba's blowing up too, he joins this band who just kicked Chris Caraba out, maybe, or Chris Caraba left for reasons that we don't fully know, but they were not getting along. And so this 19-year-old kid comes in and starts going, oh, I have to write lyrics like this, or I have to be even more. The, the pressure's totally on him alone. I remember this between these two records, everybody being like, "Well, there's this. They can't do it. It's not going to work. The follow up's not going to be any good. This they got a new singer. He can't be good." Don't you remember that? Before, you remember the time between these two records, right? Yeah. Well, you just had no idea what was going to happen. Jason was basically it was like high level karaoke. He was playing the role of Chris Caraba for Further Scenes Forever. Hmm. This is a band that he already liked, had already seen play with Chris. And then got the gig right out of high school. And now he's touring and playing really, really big shows. The band's going to go on and sell 100,000 records almost of this record. And he has no clue what he's doing. He doesn't even know how to be in a band. He's never even made a real record. So he's doing this acting job of playing the role of Chris in, in basically every way. So that's amazing, but maybe doesn't stay amazing forever. Right. He's got to, you know, he's going to have to deliver at some point. They're going to go in and do another record and... He has to become the guy that makes it good. When Jason joined Further, they still hadn't sold 100,000 records. And Chris still wasn't humongous dashboard confessional. So he took over lead singer vocals. The band starts doing better and better and better. And their record that he didn't sing on is doing better and selling more and more and more. All the while, the guy that he's replacing is just becoming phenomenally famous. <laughs> it's so crazy. Everybody now is thinking, oh, wait, you're not Chris. So he, he had to sit basically and tour for like a couple of years the whole time thinking at some point I'm going to have to write a li lyrics and sing on a record and prove I'm as good as that guy. And here's Jason on that. That's, that's when everything all of a sudden was like, oh, wait, like I'm supposed to do something like Chris, I guess. I sort of like wrote a bunch of tunes uh, stuff that I thought sounded cool, you know, and like, yeah, that sounds seen. Like, kids are gonna dig this, and like, if I just do this, I sound just like Chris, and like, you know, that that kind of shit. And uh, it really was like a, a couple nights before I was like supposed to go in the studio. I had a little freak out. I was like listening back to some demo stuff, and like, I had all this. I remember my room was like like a nightmare. It was just like scraps of paper with little lines written like everywhere, you know? And my girlfriend at the time was down in Florida, and she sort of helped me organize all those little scraps of paper. And, and sort of, you know, I had this realization that like at the end of the day, like, you know, I, I could sound like Chris, uh, or I could just be me, which is what I am. So why not just do that? I interviewed James Paul Wisner, and he talked about how uncomfortable and nervous Jason was because he was at that time then replacing somebody that was famous and was known for so their really lyrics. He really was freaking and, out. Yeah, yeah, he really was. Freak out. And James Paul Wisner helped 
kind of calm his nerves a little bit. I think Jason got super nervous. The time had been building up, building up, building up. And he went in thinking, oh, I got to write something that sounds like Chris and ultimately decided to sound like himself. And it made the record pretty damn good. Uh, I mean, to put it bluntly, Jason silenced the haters whenever How to Start a Fire came out. How to Start a Fire ended up being bigger than The Moon is Down, sold more records. Dashboard was still really, really big, but Jason had found his voice and further had solidified themselves as being their total own thing now that people could look to as, you know, an independent success. So they did the impossible and replaced Chris Caraba, and then it was happily ever after from there. No, it wasn't. These guys couldn't get along either. <laughs> Apparently, the further guys who are all you know men, like we were talking about, cannot get along with good-looking lead singers. <laughs> okay, so now Chris Caraba is an afterthought, and how does it fall apart? What happens? Here's Steve, the drummer. Well, it was horrible timing. I mean, I will say that. I mean, when everything went down initially, obviously our management was at the time to blame for some of it. Jason may be the young and impressionable, you know, no offense to him, of course, because, you know, but he was really young then. And, you know, it was just like the people that were working for us weren't equally, you know, exercising everyone's best interest, I think, at the time. And ironically, we had just got through doing some of our biggest tours. I mean, we, we were in Europe with like Thursday and Coed and Cambria, and we did all these tours for How to Start a Fire. How to Start a Fire was actually the album we definitely toured the most. Or that lineup, I should say. Whether it be Playing the Moon is Down material or when finally How to Start a Fire came out. Some of our biggest and longest tours were on that record. And so, yeah, when Jason left, it was sort of a punch in the gut. You know, partly because of the timing. Like, the music was finished for what would become Hide Nothing. These were songs Jason was supposed to be doing the lyrics for. And, of course, he did do the lyrics for one song that wound up changing with John, uh, which it's bleed on hide nothing, but it was another song because they're, they're now I've said it that, uh, that's the only thing Jason wrote upon leaving. And, you know, then we find out he got married he moved to Jersey and it's water under the bridge now. But at the time it was just a lot of bad or miscommunication. And then, uh, we were sort of left like, wow. It was just like, we had a tour coming up. We were headlining it. And then it was like Emery and, you know, Forgot who else? Amberlynn, maybe. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was a big deal. It was going to be like a five week tour. It was like a tooth and nail tour. Or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was a tooth and nail tour. Okay. Now, this part I know. Y'all were in Emory. So you. Yes. This happened to me, is the way I remember. So Emory gets signed. Uh, we, make, we make the weeks in, we get signed, and we don't know if we'll ever go anywhere for level work or not. And we find out we finally got a real tour. It's the Tooth and Nail Tour with Anne Berlin headlining Further Seems Forever, uh, our, probably our favorite band. And it's, it's the best news I've ever gotten in my life that we got that tour. We're in Seattle. Tour starts in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So we get in the van and start driving to Florida. During the trip, a r John Dunn calls us and says, there's a problem. Don't know if the tour is going to happen or not. Uh, Jason Gleason now has quit for the Seems Forever. And, and it, it was all kind of rumors going on at the time. <laughs> like he demands to ride in his own van and he needs all this stuff. And they can't, you know, there's a bunch of rumors going on of if he would do it. And they say, we're going to try and get it worked out. But he's asking for all this stuff that we can't give him. And it looks like it, it may not happen. We kept driving, obviously. Got all the way down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida to the factory. And we still don't know if the tour's on or not. Our first tour, our biggest tour, our whole career rides on this. And I walk inside the factory to find out what's going on, like the TM of the band. I walk in, and Derek, the guitar player, walks up, and he says, I want to talk to somebody from each band. So Seth from Otashiwa, Mike from Me Without You, and uh, Joey from Amberlynn uh, comes up there, and we all stand around, and he says, guys... We're not going to do the tour. We're having a a tough time right now. We're going to get this worked out, and I make you guys all a personal promise that we will take each and every one of your bands on tour when we get back up and running. (laughs) 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 He didn't didn't do do much to console us. But and he meant, yeah, I know, and it didn't do much to console us. He felt really bad, but I felt worse in my point of view. And then, Astonishingly, the Tooth and Nail tour with Amberlynn, who was a brand new band, they just headlined. We were the opener. Of course, me without you and Watashi Wa, but I mean, the tour went great anyway because it was the Tooth and Nail tour and it was awesome and it was amazing. It, it just, you just can't write stuff like that. It was just too crazy. 
Yeah, we were so fresh faced. I mean, this was the biggest tour we'd ever. Everything else had basically been DIY tours, and we were on a real tour, and we drove across the country. And we're like, "This is going to be unbelievable!" And then immediately it was taken from us. And so the same thing happens with First Things Forever. They think we're going to be on a tour, we're going to headline, and then it's, their lead singer is just gone again. And here's Jason Gleason's take on that. But yeah, when it when it really comes down to it, I I always felt whether it was how on purpose or whatever but I just I always felt like hired help um and at the time that I was feeling this way you know I really wanted to like without really thinking about all those connections and all that history that all those guys had had before I had joined them um was like hey guys like you know I've done all the touring for both albums and I am the face of the band. And when people think of further, like, sure, some of the old school kids think of Chris because he's, like, the original guy. But at the end of the day, like, I've done all the legwork. Our record sold, like, twice or three times as many copies as The Moon Is Down. Um, like, can I be in the band now kind of thing? Like, um, Which, like I said, that might have just been my own insecurities. I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, but then I left in a really terrible fashion and and the rest is history if I'm being frank uh, I now this is my own insecurities this is uh, tensions between band members and I don't know if for anyone listening ever tried to be in a band but it's not easy at all uh, you're in very very tight quarters with uh, in our case a bunch of men, sweaty men with foot smell and snoring and temper tantrums and it's long hours and it's just, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, but uh, to be- It's like worst case scenario, but with music. Yeah. And then 24 hours a day, seven days a week for months on end. And, and to be totally honest, uh, you know, looking back, I, I wish that I had maybe- gotten a little bit more introspective on it before I just sort of pulled the trigger on, on, on everything that, that transpired uh, after I said I was leaving, but um, I never felt like a member of the band. I just always felt like Chris's replacement. Wow, so the history repeats itself, trauma recreated, and Further Seems Forever is left in the same exact situation they were before. Okay, here's Steve the drummer again. And then we had just got back from doing Europe. First we were like, well, we have this music. The music's already done. I think maybe that was the thing. Like, if we were still not done writing the music and then he left, maybe that would have been a different narrative. But because the, the songs were completely finished, it's like, well, we have a record of material musically. Can we find somebody at this point, after already, like you said, after already going through it, that could actually step up in a short period of time? And that's the other thing. You know, Tooth and Nail was sort of stressing us on the time frame, too. It's like, well, which I don't, that's so weird. But, they were just like, well, it has to be done by this time for us to release it. Right. If it takes too much time, oh, yeah, exactly. Way out of time. Exactly. So, um, but yeah, then John Bunch came into our midst through uh, our Chuck Andrews, our road manager at the time. You know, Sensefield had broken up. It's like John still wants to play. So this time they replace Jason, not with a young high school kid, but an established singer in a, in a real band, an older guy, John Bunch from Sensefield. Yeah, John was this great singer and he had a ton of indie cred because Sensefield was a well-respected band. Um, and that record that they made with him I think a lot of people liked it, and I think he did what he did really well. But I think maybe member change fatigue just kind of won out there. It's just a lot to ask of fans, and it just didn't hit quite the same, and they didn't sell as many records, and the band just kind of fell flat after that. And I think the thing, too, is I can remember seeing them with John Butch, and he they now have a lead singer that's a man, too. He's not like a tight jeans-wearing, good-looking, jump-around-the-stage. He, he stood on the stage and sang his songs and cared about the way he presented himself, but he was not going to jump around stage and have the personality of the previous two singers, which I think, in a mm -hmm. lot of ways, made people go, I miss the old records. Yeah, I recall the people saw them at Cornerstone. I was w catching a different show at the time. 
I remember people going, yeah, it was all right. Here's the thing. John Bunch was John Bunch from Sensefield. So to add him to this dynamic just didn't seem to work. And so the band just ended. Now, the worst part about it is this band, has they can't hardly get an album done without changing lead singers. Now they've ended, and the singer that they liked and probably meshed with maybe even the most passed away. Bunch died on January 31st, 2016 in Irvine, California at the age of 45. His cause of death was ruled a suicidal overdose. So a super terrible ending for a great guy and, and honestly a renowned singer. Indeed, John Bunch was truly a great singer and an important person in music with both Sensefield and Further Seems Forever, and he will be dearly and truly missed by many, many thousands of people. And this is all an exercise in real life where things don't always have the narrative arc that we think they should or that we wish it did, and this is no exception to that. So we wish John's family and friends and everyone that has ever known him and cared about him our condolences and I can't help but think that people always say time heals all wounds but if you've ever lost anybody you know that's not true but time does heal some wounds and the guys from Further Seems Forever have done some other stuff they released a new record with Chris Caraba they've done reunion tours with both Chris and Jason and it seems to me that when music is good or great or even transcendent it's worth doing and it's worth more than the sum of the parts of the people that make it and the fans that sing it and it's meaningful to me as a fan of the band to see them playing again and getting along and mending old wounds i never wanted to not be involved in further um, i only ever wanted to help further and you know except for a few gaffes here or there i think we really did a great job of remaining friends even though that can be a little awkward because part of you is still in, it's like a relationship, part of you is still in love, you know? And I remember, you know, this, just one of those things, you hear a sermon, and I think the sermon was about forgiveness and, you know, holding all things in your heart that you shouldn't be holding. And I just, I remember coming home and thinking, you know what, I'm going to call Jason and just, just say, you know what, the past is the past. We don't even have to, like, talk about how things went down. Let's just say, forget about it, and let's just start over. I hope you've enjoyed our first episode. I'm your host and producer of the show, Matt Carter, along with Toby Morell and Aaron Lunsford. The show is edited by Melanie Studley and Billy Power and mixed by Brett Baird. Thanks to our assistant producers, Reva Hansen and Marshall Fremuth, and special thanks to Adam Scatula from Tooth & Nail for helping to develop the show. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Bye.